I, th I think the left doesn't like to talk about this, but war making and the state has often been a way through which progress happens. So Bismarck introduces pensions. Uh, you see big welfare reforms after the, Fra after the Franco-Prussian War because the French state says, well, our people are shorter and less less strong than, than German citizens by the looks of it. So we need to have a sort of a minimal threshold for their welfare. And I feel similarly with this stuff. So the technologies you touched on the book, stuff I write about in fully automated luxury communism, which you are, I think, rightly circumspect about there, technologically far more difficult. <clears throat> so cellular agriculture, whether that's stuff like Impossible Burger, where you're changing a, a vegetable protein, which is obviously much simpler, or you're effectively manufacturing an animal protein without killing any animals. All of this is clearly going to be a game changer for food mm, security. Massively. And I think it's no, it's no um, coincidence that Singapore is the first country to be you know, creating the, the, the regulatory framework for a lot of this. So you look at countries like the UAE, Malta, Singapore, Hong Kong, quite small land masses, quite highly populated, but no real agricultural land to speak of. And you could see why they would be all over this. And then, of course, you've got the global base of people who are already vegan or vegetarian. You've got the fitness community. And already you think, well, even if a lot of people poo-poo this, this is going to be a mainstream technology quite quite yeah, quickly, you yeah. imagine. No, I, th I think so. I think so. And, 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 and so the other thing I need to throw into this mix, so I mentioned it briefly just a moment ago. So, you know, we were talking about complex systems, right? And I've become a bit of a complex system obsessive, as you could probably tell, but... So I, I did a huge amount of reading into this because it suddenly occurred to me when I was, um, after I'd got a little way into the scientific literature, that the global food system is beginning to look very much like the global financial system in the run up to 2008. It's become unbelievably concentrated. So, um, according to one estimate, four companies control 90% of the global grain trade. Just four companies. Wow. And those same companies are becoming vertically integrated as well. They're buying into seed, into chemicals, into machinery, into packaging, processing, retailing. Um, the, the whole, the where whole gamut. Where are they based? These four uh, well, so, so you've got is, is sort of Cargill. It's, um, um, this, uh, huge Chem China and conglomerate. Uh, they do change from year to year. So they change their names all the time. Right. Syngenta. It's, um, 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 uh, Louis Dreyfus. Um, so basically European, Archie North Daniels, America, Midland. and China. Yeah. 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 Bro broadly speaking. Um, and, um, and, and they, they're massive and they're highly interlinked in ways which aren't always completely obvious, just like the banks were right now. What complex systems theory tells you, and, and again, you know, we, we there's, there's a fairly consistent principles right across all complex systems is that your system is likely to be resilient if no particular nodes within it are dominant. If um, those nodes are quite weakly connected to each other and if their behavior is not synchronized, right? And because if that's the case, shocks can't easily be transmitted through the whole system. They stop. They're sort of circuit breakers within that system. But if, like the banks in the run-up to 2008, and in fact, the chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, did a really fascinating complex system systems analysis of what went wrong in finance. It's a really great paper. In fact, he wrote with one of my old ecology lecturers, um, Robert May. And so he went to him and said, what can ecology teach us about why, why, why the banks nearly went down? And, and May said, well, actually, we've been working on exactly this, but on a, in a different system. And it's a fascinating, brilliant paper. And then Haldane did this speech to the Bank of England explaining it all in layman's terms. It was, it was very good. And, and he'd say, so, you know, what, Ecology shows us, because ecology was pretty well the first place where people were studying complex systems in, in a, in a comprehensive way, mm. is, is that if you have these, you get these super dominant nodes and nodes are like sort of knots in your fishing net and, and they become very strongly linked to other super dominant nodes and they all begin operating in the same way. That is a highly fragile system because one thing goes wrong in one node and it can bring the whole lot down. So when Lehman Brothers collapsed, if it weren't for an instant and massive global bailout, the whole financial system would have gone down. down. Now we can totally argue with the way they bailed them out and who got the money and the rest of it, but there's no question that enormous and urgent 
uh, uh, measures were needed to prevent total collapse in, in, in finance. And, and what we're seeing now is these enormous nodes developing, not just the big corporations, but also these sort of super exporter nations, um, particular ports through which the, 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 the food is passing and particular choke points. So a huge proportion of global food trade goes through the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal or the Straits of Malacca or the Turkish Straits or the Babel Mandab or the Straits of Hormuz. Um, and, and you only need a couple of those to go down and there's very serious trouble. Now, last year, the Suez Canal got um, um, jammed up completely when a freighter got stuck across it. This year, the Turkish Straits are more or less unpassable because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, you know, it's not hard to see mm. how the food chain could snap. And what makes it worse is that we've seen this sort of global trade harmonization, as they call it, um, and setting the same global standards everywhere. We've seen massive infrastructure improvements, as they're called, better roads, better ports, all the rest of it. And this has all smoothed the system. And you think, oh, well, that makes it more efficient. So that's going to be good. It makes you know, our food supply more reliable, surely. But what that's done is to enable companies to switch from stocks to flows. So they don't hold stocks anymore. It's all just in time. So if that chain snaps, suddenly there isn't any food. I mean, basically the world's food stocks are at sea at the moment. That is our food stock. And if that gets jammed up for some reason or another, or if the ships don't get loaded in the first place because, you know, Russia's invaded Ukraine, there's no food from Russia or Ukraine suddenly, um, then, then instantly, that chain is broken and not only are people going to go hungry immediately as the shelves will just empty overnight as they did at the beginning of the pandemic for instance but also you could then see a chain reaction going on through 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 the whole food system which is exacerbated by speculation there's massive financial speculation in food now now when they bailed out the banks well you could do that with finance because you could borrow money from the future right you can't borrow food from the future it's a bit of a concern because with the recapitalization of the banks in, in 2008, like you say, you say to the central bank, we'll create some bonds and, you know, we'll basically create some zeros on a computer and pass them between various institutions. But when you're talking about the real world and food and millions of people needing their next meal, that's a, that's a much bigger logistical challenge. It, it literally keeps me awake at night. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that figuratively. I wake up in the middle of the night and think, Oh Christ, blind. This can't be true. But you know, I've been reading these scientific papers now going back 10 years mm. saying, governments, you need to be aware of this. This is really, really scary. Mm. You know, this is, this is, this is worse than you could possibly imagine because if this goes and, and everyone's ignored it, it's been mm. completely ignored. And you know, someone said, you know, how every disaster movie starts with, with, with a scientist being ignored. You know, for 10 years, these scientists have been ignored on what could be the most important issue of all. Mm. And no one's been paying attention to it. But, but some countries are on top of it to an extent. So for instance, France, I think produces like 10% of the, of the world's wheat, which is just astonishing for such mm. a small country. Yeah, yeah. India, obviously huge numbers of people have domestic food deprivation, mm. but if it wanted to tomorrow to stop exporting rice, etc., it can it can broadly look after itself. Then you look at sorry. You well, to I was going to say. I mean, I, actually, th this is a really interesting example because in mid April, um, when it became clear that we that no food was going to be coming out of Ukraine, mm. which is a hugely important um, grain producer and grain exporter. Uh, the Indian government came forward and said, don't worry, we've got a great harvest on the way. We'll fill the gap. We'll raise our exports because we've got a great harvest. Then that enormous heat wave struck northern India and Pakistan and the grain just shriveled on the plant. And, and within four weeks, far from raising its exports, India had imposed a total export ban mm. at, at which, at which point the price of food shot up even higher and, and, and even more people are thrown into food insecurity and hunger. And, and it, so yes, countries can, certain countries can look after themselves. Mm. Some can, but there are now huge uh, uh, areas of the world where they're totally dependent on imports. So if you look at Egypt, and in fact, the whole of North Africa, most of the Middle East, um, at some major sections of sub-Saharan Africa as well, you know, you cut those imports off, instant starvation. 